Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Bible study. If you are here for Bible study, you're in the right place. If you are here for another reason, change your plans. A few announcements. Uh, I just want to celebrate for just a moment the parking lot. I, I only say that because in cleaning the building, there's so much less dirt. And that, you, I, you can tell something has changed. Come on, I'm going to preach for a second. You can tell something's changed on the outside because of what's happened on the inside. Uh-huh. All right. Uh, I, did, I worked on a project today here in the building that I had been holding off on because I didn't have a big place to do it in. And I was like, now I can spread out on this big piece of black top and do what I need to do outside instead of having to deal with the dirt and the rocks. Mm. Somebody get excited. Uh, all right. Let's see. Men, you're going to a, a, a men's event at Jonathan Morgan's house on Saturday. I only need a um, head count for food. So if you haven't gone to the Facebook page, you don't have to be a Facebook member. You can just go to Facebook through our, our, uh, uh, our church Facebook page. Click that you're going. If you're interested, that's fine. But if you're going, I would like to know that so we can make sure we've got enough food on the, on the plate for you. Uh, we've got a parents' phase meeting coming up on the 24th. Uh, I just want to push this again. It's such a great experience. If you are a parent or a grandparent, um, it's a great way to get some, some kid knowledge in your head. And Jesse does a fantastic job. I can't say enough good about it. Um, and then there's some sharing that happens. If you haven't been to one... Um, there's some question and answer, and there's, a, there's some sharing that happens with the group of experiences and best tips and this kind of stuff. So phase meetings, uh, it's just a phase that they're in. And uh, the, the, the standard line is we are ra raising children, we're raising adults because we're getting them from childhood into adulthood. So, great time. And then uh, our family weekend coming up at the end of the month. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Uh, Trent Sharon, evangelist, is going to be with us on Saturday and Sunday. So, please um, make sure that you're going to be a part of this. We've got, we've got our t-shirts for tie-dyed t-shirts. They are going to be so cool. It's got TPC kids across them. Uh, for kids or adults, it's going to be really cool. Uh, so, exciting. What am I missing? Anything? All right. Oh, thank you. Yes. We have a winner. They will not be revealed. <laughs> Come to church on Sunday. You're going to see somebody get smacked in the face. Are we going to give them a choice on the pie? Oh. Maybe we should ask each each group. Do you want? Yeah. Okay. So come on Sunday. Thanks for supporting that fun event and uh, supporting our kids who are at camp today. We already have had kids receiving the Holy Ghost, and that's exciting. Uh, so this is a huge, uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of kids that are at this camp. It's a great experience for our folks. So. Uh, we want to go to the Lord in prayer, praying for our kids at camp. Uh, Pastor Dustin is there. Uh, Mike and Amanda are there. Um, and, of course, all of our kids and the rest of the uh, children's ministry team for Missouri District. We want to keep, the, keep them in prayer. Uh, pray for uh, Neil. This is Clarice uh, Miller's husband in uh, Mayo Clinic this week. Very serious if you got the prayer request. Uh, you saw that he is not gaining weight, uh, dealing with a cancer situation. He's on a feeding tube, 
uh, talked to him just briefly this week. Um, the Lord needs to do something for Neil. And of course, we want to pray for Clarice too, that the Lord would, would minister to her uh, as well. And the Lord knows how to take care of that. Pray for Patty Dodd tonight. Uh, she needs healing in her body. Somebody else have a prayer request. Harold. Let's pray for Josh and Linda tonight. Ask the Lord to be with them. Yes, ma'am. Pray for Elizabeth tonight. Thank you. Uh, uh, Carissa's brother, Derek, um, in a bad situation health-wise right now. Uh, doctors are trying to figure it out. And Carissa and Tim have great faith. And they're believing that the Lord's going to do something good for him. Lydia? Let's ask the Lord to be with Lydia. And take care of what needs to be taken care of. Anybody else? All right. Stand with me tonight. Let's take these needs to the Lord. Get your faith out. and Let's use it right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being with us. Lord, you're marvelous, miraculous. Lord, you're awesome in all of your ways. We thank you, Lord, for doing a good work in the needs that we have called before you tonight. Lord, you have not left us and we're so thankful that you are hearing us right now. Touch Neil Miller right now, Jesus. Lord, you see what's happening in his body. Lord, I pray for his spirit. Lord, for his condition. I ask you to be merciful to him tonight. Be with Patty Dodd. Lord, strengthen her. Strengthen her body right now. Lord, you know what's happening in Derek's life. You see all these conditions that the doctors are fighting with. You are able to speak peace to him right now in the name of Jesus. Release him from the fever, from the infection. I thank you, Lord, for being his strength today. Lord, I commit Lydia into your hands. You see the test that she has coming up. I pray that you would let your will be done in her body in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for touching Josh and Linda. Lord, I pray that you'd go to their home. Send your peace, Lord. Send your love, your compassion. We love you today for what you are doing in our lives, in us, Lord Jesus. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Just a reminder, this week we are praying uh, that the Lord's Spirit would be poured out on hungry hearts. So we're praying all week for the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. If anybody wants a devotion, we have them. I'm just going to keep pushing that out there to you. We're in 2.1, starting a new series tonight. The series is called God is Our Refuge. We are going to hear that scripture, a very present help in time of trouble. We're going to be going through four different psalms tonight. We're going to settle on Psalms 22. Next week, Psalms 34, Psalms 46 and Psalms 55, talking about how the Lord will bring strength, will bring peace, healing to those who are hurting, uh, who are overcome with their burdens. No matter what we face in life, aren't you thankful that the Lord, to quote Carol Magruder, is our burden bearer? He will carry us and our burden. Amen. Our lesson tonight is that I will the, the big idea is that we're going to be able to cry out to the Lord and trust him in our suffering. And our focus verses out of Psalms uh, 22, uh, David saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Verse 2, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. The Lord will give us strength. He is not far from any of us. But there are times when it feels like we have been tasked with too much for us to carry. This is a very difficult lesson series to teach because I find that whenever I teach or I preach something, I soon get to put into practice what I am preaching or teaching. 
And so I look at this series and I think, I don't want to get into this. I want to talk about the love of God. I want to talk about his, his goodness to us and his blessings. I don't want to talk about misery because nobody wants to live in a place of misery. Nobody chooses to say, and man, do I ever want to start. I've said this many times. I want to start a foundation called Move On Out. If you don't like it where you are, you can apply for a grant to move on out. I hate this town. It's the most boring town. There's nothing ever happening here. Well, move on out. We'll, we'll support you in that. This is the worst job I've ever had. I hate the, my boss. I hate the people I work with. This is a terrible place. They don't pay me enough. Move on out. Find yourself a place of joy and peace. For goodness sake, for the rest of our sake, let us all be at peace and you go on down your way. Life is too short to be miserable. Most of us assume, or you have assumed at one point, that as a child of God, you will not have trouble. And that is not scriptural. Why am I doing this way? I thought I, God loved me. We're going to get into some of that a little bit. It is human for us to think that we are, because we're just good people, because we're just happy all the time, that everything's going to be pleasant. And that is not what the Scripture says. In this world, you will have tribulations, trouble, even when you are faithfully living for the Lord. Go to Acts chapter 14 with me. We're going to examine some of Paul's storyline. Faithful living. Paul embodies this for us. Verse 8, and uh, Gabe, I'm going to run through the, the chapter 14 a little bit. He has been in Iconium, Paul has, for a while, and a group of Jews who are angry at what they are teaching transfer themselves from another city to, this, to Iconium and stir up a bunch of trouble to the point where he's getting threats, death threats. You're going to get stoned. And so they, they leave the city and they go to Lystra. And while he's in Lystra, he sees a man who is listening to him. The scripture says he's listening intently and Paul can see that he has faith. And he says to this man, who is crippled, he's unable to walk. Verse 10, he says, stand up on your feet. And in that moment, he does. And I mean, this is, this is scripture right here. Signs and wonders will follow them that believe. The word is preached. The man believes. He has faith. And I mean, we're talking revival. This is what every preacher wants to see in an apostolic service. Somebody comes in with a need, the Lord sees their faith, he meets the need, and someone else's faith is increased. I mean, this is revival. This is what we want. And in verse 11, the people around see what Paul has done. They raise their voices, and they're calling out that the gods have come down among us. And they name Barnabas Zeus, they named Paul Hermes because he's the guy who's doing all the speaking. And Luke is so, is so wonderful to tell us this. Draws in a little bit of mythology and throws that in there. Isn't that fun how he does that? The priest of Zeus brings out an oxen, brings out garlands, big, big uh, flower arrangements. And they're going to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. And Paul is freaking out. Because he knows if this happens, even if, if, even if I don't even want it to happen, if it happens, there's no telling what is going to happen to me. I don't want the Lord to strike me dead because of their stupidity. I don't want them to, to sacrifice to me and, and somehow it gets rubbed off on me and my pride takes a jump. He's trying desperately. He's running into the crowd. Stop! And they will not listen to them and they are just there well the scripture says they tear their clothes like oh no 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 <laughs> <laughs> and 
And unfortunately, in verse 19, Jews from Antioch and Iconium, where they just were, show up on the scene and stir up more trouble. And this time, they get it done. You ask yourself, I'm doing a good thing here. I'm following the will of the Lord. I'm being faithful to his word. And now I'm getting stoned for it. It looks like Paul gets to sit in class with us tonight and learn how to trust him in suffering. Verse 21, they are, uh, or verse 19, they stone him. They leave him outside the city gates thinking he's dead. The disciples gather around. He revives, whether miraculously or just comes back into a conscious state. And he and Barnabas head to Derby. Listen to what 21 says. When they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, where he had been stoned, to Iconium and to Antioch, where he had faced great resistance, persecution, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. If we're going to get into the kingdom, we're going to go through tribulation. And Paul knew what that felt like. He was still nursing the bruises and the bumps and the scrapes from the many tribulations as he was preaching to those saints. Greatest follower of Christ you can imagine. Suffering and showing us in his own experience his own teaching, that where faithfulness is, there is also suffering. It's just part of it. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul says this. Blessed be the God and Father and Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our, our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble, and with comfort with which we ourselves are comforted. I need that warm blanket of the Lord and his love and his spirit to come down around me and give me some comfort. My bruises from today, the words that were said to me, the stones that were thrown my way, the the bad news that I got, I need some comfort, Lord. And I'm going to take that same blanket that I've wrapped myself with, I'm going to hand it to Eddie and say, Eddie, here's some of God's love that I've wrapped myself in. Comfort yourself with some of the the comfort of the Lord. I've been through some tribulation. I feel you. I understand what you've been going through. The Lord's going to strengthen me in my suffering. I'm telling you, this is not a happy, nobody's going to run the aisles over suffering. I'm so excited, I'm in a trial. I'm so excited, I'm in a trial. Woo! I stubbed my toe yesterday and I bit my tongue today. I'm so excited. Tell me one of the most stressful days you've ever had. The first one that just came into mind, whatever that was. Don't, don't grade them, just whatever stressful day it was that came into mind. Anybody got one? You, so nobody wants to share their stressful day. Because this is what happens. You start comparing yourselves among each other. Oh, that's nothing. You call that stress. Well, let me tell you about, okay, well, go ahead. Andy? Mom's heart attack. Stress. Absolutely. So much to get done and not enough time. (laughs) 
I'm so nervous. Cases on the line. I had a grant that I, go ahead. Birth of children. <laughs> and for women. We had a relatively event-free birth. Eight hours of here we go, here we go, here we go. And there we went. It was, mm, I don't know, it may have been 10 years ago. I was running a grant, and it was due at midnight. And I was running right ragged up to the very edge. And I will never forget, I had finished everything. All of it's filled in. It's online. You have to fill it. It's so much work budgets and everything, hit submit, and it refreshed and said, you've been locked out. And I promise you, my feet, like my legs, I, I just collapsed. I'm in my office at midnight, 1158. It wasn't even midnight. The state's clock was wrong. I was just beside myself. Money, we're talking thousands of dollars on the line. Stress. Oh, I'm moving on. We're done with that. <laughs> so let's go, let's go to Job chapter one. I called, says this is the beauty part. This particular grant was run by some very compassionate people, and they stayed up in their offices all night long waiting for the grants to come in so if you had questions you could call and i called and i said i can't remember the guy's name but i knew him by name i said i have submitted and it's locked me out and he's like oh it's no problem scott hang on a second okay now i just released it hit it again i refreshed it popped up hit submit <laughs> Oh, drag my sorry little self all the way home. Very little joy. <laughs> Very little joy. Job chapter 1. Verse six, 6 tells us, after we're introduced to Job, that the angelic sons of God had come to present themselves before the king of kings. And surprisingly to us, but it doesn't seem like a surprise to the writer, Satan showed up. God asked him, what have you been doing? And he replies, I've been going to and fro, in verse 7, walking up and down in the earth. And apparently Peter either pulled from that or knowing the the situation that he had been in under the ministry of Jesus in 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, their enemy that is of your soul is like a what? Lion prowling around looking for someone to devour. Satan said exactly that's what I've been doing. I'm just looking for bait. I will say in Revelation 12, The, the accuser, Scripture talks about, the accuser of the brethren. He's just looking for something to do. He's a bored adolescent, opening closets and pantries, waiting. Is there anything in here? Nope. Slam. Uh, is there anything in here? Nope. Slam. Oh, hey, we found the Cheetos. And it's Andy's Cheetos. And we're going to destroy him. The Lord replies in, in, in 1 8, Have you considered Job? It's like the Lord is just like kicked back. If I, can, if, I can, if I can humanize the Spirit of God, he's just a kick back in his wing chair with a lemonade. And he's like, Hey, speaking of, have you seen Job while you've been wandering around? It's perfect. There's none like him. 
upright, fears God, eschews or he pushes away evil. And his response is, well, yeah, because you've got your hand on him. In verse 11, he says, if you'll pull your hand back, he'll curse you to your face. His implication, his accusation from Revelation is that the blessing is what decides or or, uh, pushes the relationship. I'm just in it for the stuff. This is a sugar daddy or a sugar mama. I'm just here for what I can get out of you. Notice the accusation is not grounded in any level of truth. It's completely fake. But he pushes that accusation in the very throne room of God. God says, fine. You do what you got to do. I'll open up the hedge and you have your way. Think about this. If Satan couldn't attack Job without God allowing it, and if God put limitations on the extent to which Satan could attack Job, you think Satan can attack us at any time, any way he wants? I think sometimes we allow our flesh to be accused as Satan. Satan's been at me all day. No, it's been your flesh. You've just been undisciplined and irresponsible and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The devil hadn't had to do anything. But as a child of God, what this says to me is that the enemy has to look for the keys to come at me. If you look at the temptation of Jesus in 4.13 of Luke, when the devil had ended all the temptations, he departed him for a season. Another uh, translation says, for another opportunity. He had come at him, and he was going to leave and come back later. Take that for what it is. I don't know that the Lord, um, the Scripture says, will not put on us more than we can deal with. Job gets immediate attention from Satan. His opportunity, his season was upon him. And then it begins. The Sabians have raided and killed your servants with a sword. They've taken all the oxen and donkeys. Only I escaped. As that guy is speaking, there's no, uh, there's no pause. Fire falls from heaven, burns up your sheep and your shepherds. Only I have escaped. The Chaldeans attacked, took all your camels, killed all your servants. Only I have escaped. Wiped out everything. And then while he is reeling from the news of his material loss, another servant runs up. Your sons and your daughters were all at your oldest son's house. A tornado struck the house, collapsed on him, killed all of them. Only I have escaped. The response of Job is in verse 20. He arrives, he, he, he stands up, he rips his clothes, which is the classic form of cultural expression of grief. He shaves his head, falls down on the ground, and worships. Verse 21, naked I came into my, from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. We quote this on a regular basis. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, verse 22, he did not charge God falsely or with any wrong. vindication for the throne room of God and for the life of Job, the accuser was silenced. Not necessarily so. 
He's going to continue pushing, just the way it happened with the temptation of Jesus. If I can't get you here, I'll try you over here. If I can't get you there, let me try you one more time. Skin for skin, this is Job 2. All that a man has, he'll give for his life. Satan thinks he knows your man. I know what you're thinking. No, he doesn't. If you'll put forth your hand now and touch his bone and flesh, he'll curse you to your face, he says. Worship to cursing on the bodily experience. And that was not the case. Immediately, he's got the boils wrapped around his body. He's sitting in a heap of ashes, mourning the loss of everything, scraping his, his, his sores with the, the last remnants of his uh, material possessions, a broken piece of pottery. And three of his friends show up, and God bless him for coming to be a part of it, but they are so shocked when they see him that they sit for seven days staring at him in silence. At the very least, they could have gone out and sat in the parking lot. It's so nice. What can you say whenever you face that kind of suffering, when you face that kind of loss? And Job is so grieved. He's so dismayed at what he has lost. When he breaks his silence, he curses the day. Why was I, when I was born, it was a day of cursing. Everything that I have dreaded has come upon me. I have no rest. I'm not quiet. Trouble is here. Now let's talk about those two friends, those three friends for a minute. Think about your own life. If you had a time, a place where you were in either physically or emotionally sitting in the ash heap, do you have an encouraging friend? Do you have someone who would show up and at the very least stare at you in silence? Oh, this is uncomfortable. Silence. Do you have an encourager, an encouraging friend? Or flip that question, would you be a friend of encouragement? Would you be one who would stand with someone, sit with someone, get down in the sawdust, the ashes of what's left with someone, and face that difficulty with them? David in Psalms 22, Stephen's going to jump into this in just a minute, but he, he roars out this anguish. In my mind, it is a, it's, a, it's a deep guttural, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you gone so far from me? You can't help me from the distance that you're at. My words of roaring when I cry in the daytime, you don't hear me. And in the night, I, I, I'm not silent and you're not listening. Jesus on the cross used these same words when he was getting ready to give up the ghost. He's feeling the weight of all of this turmoil on him, all this sin, and his response as the Spirit of God is leaving that body and removing itself from the, 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 the unholy, unrighteous nature that is falling, the world falling upon that body. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But what this does for us, Job, David, it sets a pattern that gives us some hope. Because when you're sitting in the ash heap of your whatever, life, loss, whatever it is, you can say in a whisper, in anguish, in a roar, are you here? Have you forsaken me? God, what is going on? What, why, why am I going through this? What are, what are you doing to me? And it's okay. It's okay 
for you to feel that anguish. It's okay for you to have that guttural, just gut level, base animal reaction of, oh, this is not what I wanted. And I don't want to live this way. And I need some relief. Where are you, God? Because this is what the scripture says in Psalm 50 and 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. In the air conditioning, in the soft padded pew, we decide now, Lord, you have been so good to me, and I'm going to establish in my life an attitude of gratitude right now. So that whenever I'm in the ash heap, I have a spirit that is ready to worship instead of curse. Stephen, finish this off here. Well, I know we all have a lot of struggles and pains in life, but what Job went through... The pain he went through and the rate at which he went through it was a heavy load to carry. It was an unexpected test that showed up at his doorstep that day, and it changed his life completely. So, I mean, I know we all have a lot of stresses that we deal with, but not many, I think, want to put theirs up beside Job's and compare it. And maybe you haven't ex- suffered extreme losses like Job, but maybe your losses came in a different package. Maybe you have grieved the death of a child or grieved a child rejecting the Lord. Perhaps you've been betrayed by a loved one. Maybe you've been persecuted by or for your faith. Maybe you've had tribulations and trials that hit you home and meant a lot to you. And maybe you had to watch the loved one. Like Andy said, his mom's heart attack was a big stressful day for him because watching loved ones hurt and suffer is no fun. It certainly is not. And so we have tests that come to us unexpected, uninvited, and yet they show up. Have you ever had a test in school that was unexpected by you but known to everyone else? Not because you weren't told, but you have not been paying attention or were not listening or grabbing a hold of the due date in which it was due, and you're like, this cannot be happening. There is no way there's a test today. And a lot of times in life, we get circumstances where things come at us and we're like there is no way seriously I've already got enough stuff going on I got enough problems I don't have time for this it was a test that we weren't wanting or inviting but nonetheless it was there and because of these struggles we sometimes assume that God is not paying attention to us that somehow he has forsaken us And we may think that God is hardly even aware that he knows that these struggles are even even happening. And so at these times, David's words in Psalms 22, verse 1, perfectly expresses our sadness. Scott mentioned it. My God, my God, why haste thou forsaken me? If these struggles are bad enough, we may, like Job, wish we had never been born. That's a hard line to cross, but when someone's in dire pain and dire depression and struggle, that's sometimes the reality of how they're feeling. Because of these uncertain events, we can adopt a perspective of fear and doubt that dominates our thinking and robs us of our focus of where it should be. So we pray, and we pray for answers, and we pray for deliverance, and we pray at least for God's comforting presence to show up and sometimes answers come at once and we are ecstatic and it feels like God is close to us and sometimes 
those answers do not appear in the way we had hoped. And we may double down our own efforts, thinking we didn't pray hard enough. And we cry out to God, but still we receive no answers. Like David in Psalms 22, verse 2, we cry in the daytime, but apparently God is not listening. We cry out in the night season and are not silent, but God is silent. No answers come, no comforting touch of his presence seems to surround us, and our prayers seem to go unanswered. I know this is heavy stuff tonight, but this is a reality of what a lot of people are dealing with currently. In Psalms 22, it seems David's sense of abandonment was increased by remembering the stories of how God had delivered the Israelite ancestors. Now, why would his sense of abandonment be increased? And this is how perspectives of humans differ, but this is very fascinating. Psalms 22, verse 4 through 5 says, Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But when it came to my answer and it came to my deliverance, there was no deliverance that seemed to be happening. He was trusting and crying out. He was trying and he was crying, but nothing. And Yahweh had been David's God from the very beginning as long as he can remember and David had hoped and he had trusted and he had put his faith faith in God his whole life it was not in vain but he had known the presence of God in the past so now he called on God to remember their relationship and for him to draw near again and deliver him from his misery a misery in which God himself certainly would be the only one that would be allowed to take him from the condition that he was in. And so Psalms chapter 22, we're reading here in verse 12. He says, he's talking about his misery. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls have beset me round. They gapped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my boils. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. David is letting his heart out to God. David acknowledged where he was in limelight of his misery that he was in at that specific time, but he didn't camp out there forever. He turned to his attention to God and said in verse 22, or verse 19, excuse me, of chapter 22, but be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. So he flips the script. David recognized his strength was found in God. God has brought me out before, and he can certainly do it again. You know, you can use your past experiences to boost your faith up. You know, God did it for me before. He can do it for me again. God took care of my financial need then. I know he's more than able to do it now. God made a way where there was no way. He still has his power in place. He's still on the throne. He healed my body before, and I know he can do it again. God will give strength to those who turn to him in their suffering, and we can stand on the promises of God, and we can encourage ourselves in the Lord. We don't know how long David had to endure the misery that he was in, but he continued to seek God for strength, and God did hear him, and God did relieve him of his suffering. In deep gratitude and relief, David cried out, you have answered me, 
in that process, David was reminded that he may have felt forsaken, but God nevertheless never left his side. The Bible says he'll never leave you or forsake you, but it never says you'll never feel like he never left you or forsaked you. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6 tells us, be strong and have a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, he nor forsake thee. We have a God that cares about where we are at. Isaiah 41 and 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And Psalms 46 and 1 assures us God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Because of this, the psalmist added, therefore, we will not fear because we have our very present help. I'm thankful for that. God never promised we would not have trouble in this life. He did promise, however, to be our help in trouble. And so God is not simply there floating around just to observe our trouble, just to witness it like maybe Job's friends were just staring at him. I know if people were just staring at me and I was in great agony, it would take not seven days before I would speak up and say, what do you want? (laughs) Would you stop looking at me? I just want to be alone right now. But that's why we're reading about David tonight, not myself. And so God is our present help in time of need. He is exactly who he says he is, and he knows exactly where we are in life. And so we can come boldly before his throne And we can obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. And God promises to be present and strengthen us in suffering. In our response, we can say that I choose to believe and focus my attention on the promises of God and not deliberately go through and just contemplate my thoughts on the misery. I I heard Rick Warren once say, if you're going through hell, well, don't camp out there. Keep going. Like, keep looking toward God and get out of there. we got a quick video we want to show you. And uh, if we could pull that out. I'm thankful for God's word. He has given us many promises throughout his word. He said that in Psalms that his word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I'm thankful for that promise alone because I know that I need that on a daily basis. One of the things that my pastor taught us is that in his word, to read it every day, to pray it every day, he taught us a rule of five, five things that you do every day. One of those being reading his word. Write down some of those promises, those scriptures that he has in his word, those promises that he has for us. Write them down and pray over them every day because that's what strengthens us. That's what gives us hope. That's what gives us peace and comfort. I know that in many times when people are suffering, that they need that peace and that hope. That's why we give them scriptures to read and to pray every day so that whenever they go back to that word, whenever they're having a moment where they're just not feeling comforted and they're not feeling that peace and that hope of maybe after losing a loved one or something that significant, that they can go back to those scriptures and they can read those scriptures and they can pray those scriptures. I'm so thankful that God's word stands true, that he will always be there for us, that he will always be there and help us and strengthen us and give us that peace and hope. Thank God for his word. Amen, amen. So if you're suffering today and everyone has sufferings on a daily basis, whether they're big or small, but we can stand on those promises like we talked about. And just hearing these promises may not immediately uh, make you feel so amazing. It may not change your perspective at that moment of pain, 
but you can begin to at least commit to claiming these promises and adopting them. You can be angry at God. You can doubt God for letting us suffer. And in response, we can sometimes turn from him, from him because we are angry at what he, as a sovereign God, has allowed to happen in our life. And we must give him the opportunity to work in our lives because he knows what we need more than we do. There's no doubt we all have needs, but you know God doesn't just respond to needs. If God just responded to needs, there would be no need. But God responds to faith. God acknowledges those who cry out to him in suffering. And sometimes God delivers us from the fire, and sometimes he makes us go through the fire. And after you've gone through the fire and you've come out the other side and you, you went through some things, you have a different perspective and you have a stronger faith in God and you've learned some things along the way. I heard T.F. Tinney once say, pain causes some men to break down and others to break records. So you can decide to let pain destroy you or you can let it develop you. It's your perspective of pain. Like Scott's mentioned, Satan did not get to be able to do those things to Job without God's permission. In fact, the Lord was actually presenting Job there as the one that had to go through it all. And so if you're going through some pain tonight, we can be encouraged a little bit. That maybe God didn't put more than he knows we can handle because he trusts us with that pain. He trusts us and he knows that he wants to develop us. And so he knows exactly what types of pain in our lives can allow us to grow. And so there's power in pain. There's purpose in pain. But no one wants to go through pain. And I don't blame them. Naturally, no one likes pain but pain does not have to destroy you. It can make you be more like God because once you've gone through something, you can be more sympathetic to someone going through something very similar to that. In a world of hurting people that are looking to help with their own pain and their own problems, and they're like, if I have to go through pain, I want to know going through pain with God is better than going through pain without God. And so, as believers, we have that testimony that we can share with them how God has brought us through some real pain in our life. No one likes to suffer with pain that literally disrupts your day-to-day -day life. It comes in like a hurricane, and it destroys all kinds of emotional stigmas that you may have. And so, tonight I want to encourage you, try not to just focus on the why of your suffering, but dwell on God's promises to strengthen you and deliver you. Dwell on even more mark, remarkable promise is that God will cause all things in your life to work together for good. And God may one day reveal or explain why you had went through that. And maybe he won't. After all, God never told Job why we read in scripture. The only thing Job knew for sure was that he had not turned from God. And in time, God had restored his fortune and ended his suffering. And though we have no promise that we'll get an explanation, we can cling to what was promised to us. And as we follow the examples of these great men, Job and David and Paul, all who refused to turn from God, we can take some encouragement in that. We know if they did it, God gave them strength to do it. We have the spirit. God can give us strength to do it. And we trust him to do so. And so, in gratitude, we can praise him as Paul did. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all. Comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation. If you're wondering tonight if God cares, I'm here to tell you that God cares where you're at. He desperately 
wants relationship, and he wants you to call out to him in struggles. In fact, many times you'll find when you're going through struggles, you earnestly seek the Lord more. And I know we've heard that, and it's kind of a design element to bring you closer to God. And sometimes he wants to show his power in your life, and we don't always like the avenue of which it has to happen. But normally in a after hindsight effect, we can testify that we're better because of it. And so not only that, we want to be an encouragement to those who are suffering in pain. If you've ever been in pain, in real pain, in all kinds of different ways, it can be emotional, it can be physical, you know, sometimes, you know, you're not wanting to be around a million people because these people don't make you feel so good because they're laughing things off as light, but to you it's a big deal. It may not bother them, but maybe their pain wouldn't bother you, but you know, you have an effect that you're dealing with something serious, and others are like, ah, that ain't no big deal. Like Scott said, oh, my story's better. You should, oh, you thought you had it bad, you should hear what I went through. And so, we wanna pray tonight that the Lord would be with those that are suffering, I know we're all suffering in some element, but serious suffering, little suffering, it don't matter. God cares. If it bothers you, you know it bothers God. Would you stand with me tonight? Neil Miller, we want to pray for him again tonight in a bad place. A prime example of someone suffering tonight. And the Lord is more than able to take care of this situation right now. We want to pray for those suffering, and we want to pray that we can be an encouragement to those suffering, that we can point people to the Lord. Let's pray tonight and ask him to help us tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Oh, God, you are our strength. We thank you. You are our pillar. Lord, we turn to you, and we turn to you alone. Lord, we thank you for being our strength and our weakness, O oh God. Lord, we lift up Neil Miller tonight. Lord, we pray that you would be merciful to him. Your hand of protection would reach right where he's at. Lord, you would step into his situation. You would step into the, the, the bad things that have occurred, Lord, that need healing tonight. And Lord, you are his answer tonight, O oh God. And we, Lord, give you the praise for it, Jesus. We pray, O oh God, for everyone's suffering, whether it's little or big, Lord, that you would overshadow them with peace tonight, Lord. You would overshadow them with comfort tonight, Lord. You would let them know, O oh God, that you know exactly where they are. You know exactly what they're going through. You know exactly what you're, they're dealing with. We pray, O oh God, that you would just overshadow them, O oh God, with your mighty spirit. We pray, oh God, that you would help us be an encouragement, Jesus, no matter where we go. When we walk out these doors, Lord, and we see a hurting world, that you would, Lord, give us a specific word. You would give us a specific word of encouragement. You would let our actions be encouraging to others, oh God. And Lord, we want you to have all the glory. We want people to recognize they can find healing and peace in you, Jesus. And we thank you, oh God, for being who you are and being so merciful to all those suffering tonight in jesus name amen amen well god bless you everyone thank you for being here this week try to be an encouragement to someone somehow some way you have what it takes to be an encouragement god bless you thank you for being here lord willing we'll see you sunday